simple way. So I'm going to start a series today. We're going to call it a summer series, and it's a simple title, and it's for everybody in this room and you that, that are worshiping online. I want everybody to hear this. The title of this message is called Live Happy. I command you to live happy. You will live happy. Oh, we're going to need the happiness. See, we come through a very challenging three years. It's time to put on the happy meter and say, okay, oh God, help me to live according to your words. It's Psalms 37 verse 4 that I want to anchor this series on. Uh, I memorized it years ago, delight thyself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I like this translation. Take delight in the Lord. He'll give you your heart's desire. Jesus has the greatest sermon, what's called the Sermon on the Mount. He has eight statements that we use the word, blessed are the poor in spirit, Matthew 5, 3. 3 through 12 is the eight statements, Matthew 5, 3. The old English word for blessed is happy. Happy are the poor in heart and spirit. Happy, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus took the beginning and the, uh, the number one topic of the Sermon of the Mount, starting off to talk about what happiness looks like and about being happy. And he said the entrance into the kingdom of God starts right here, poor in the spirit. We're going to talk about that today. This week it was this phrase. On Tuesday, the last thing on my mind was being able to get up here in front of you as my heart was, I guess I had braced myself up and then then the tears came. Then the grief just started rolling out of me, <clears throat> and I'm thankful. I was reading, I was reading uh, all week long. I was just reading in the scriptures because you know there are two places I go to I find the identification of my heart. I identify with the Psalms. I, there are words in the Psalms, and, and that's what they're there for. They're there for our comfort and our learning and our. The heart cry can come out of Psalms when often it can't come anywhere else. Sometimes the prophets, and of course, the Apostle Paul is raw and real at different times. And I was reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and he was, he's describing his own reality and things. And I read this phrase, he would say this and then that, almost like he was putting into uh, both polarization, the tension between the two. He would say, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And I thought, that's me. That's me. I'm sorrowful, but I am rejoicing. How many knows you can live and be in both realities at the same time? You can be. And I, I like the New, New Living Translation. Our hearts ache. That's what I read. But we will always have joy. We will have joy. You know, uh, growing up in the church, it was, you know, and, and you've heard, that, heard this, you know, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't concern yourself being happy. Just have joy on the inside. How many knows that's foolishness? Happy and joy, enjoy, delight. All of these are in the same fa family, right? They're all in the same family. It, it's all together when I bring all of those words together that I can be joy, joyful, happy, enjoy. Those are all, and I want to talk about that. I grew up, you know, in... Um, in a church that, man, uh, you, you're so happy. There must be something wrong. You must be doing something wrong. If you grew up in what's called the Wesleyan holiness tradition of any kind, a lot of denominations came out of the turn of the century of the, of the uh, uh, 20th century, at the end of the 19th century. We have Church of God, Church of God uh, in Christ, which we came out of, the Assemblies of God, Church of God of Prophecy, Foursquare, all of them built on that what's called Wesleyan faith holiness, a lot of that was, there, it, it almost went to the extreme that if you joined anything, if you're having a good time, then you're going you're gonna to ruin it because you can be so happy that you're gonna, the goodness of the thing is going to lose because it's got to be borderline sin. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, um, I'm, I got saved as a teenager and uh, love athletics, love sports, but I didn't know it, that that was kind of, you know, uh, not frowned a little bit on. And on, on Friday nights, I was the high school quarterback, but on Saturday morning, I went to what we had, we called bus ministry. I had a bus, a woman was the driver, she was the captain, I did the door-to-door. -door. Uh, we went door-to-door -door on Saturday, Saturday morning, get up, go breakfast, eight or nine, and we would pray for a few minutes ago, and then we'd go down the streets, and I had a whole bus that I got filled up with children and different people. I did that for a couple years, but i get beat up on Friday, and, and then get so sore getting out of bed, Mike, on Saturday morning to go do that. 
that, but I loved it. I loved, I loved seeing the children come to church, and that was my, but then on Sunday, I think, oh, man, I hope my name's not in the paper because some of them older saints are going to see that I scored a touchdown, and they're going to frown on me. Why is it? Isn't sometimes the church, I mean, well, it's not God. Hey, listen, God created you to have joy. He created you to have happiness. He's created us to be happy. But sometimes man, religion wants to right, rip the arteries out of anything happy. Oh, God, put joy back in your church. Put some happy back in the seats. Put some happy back in our life. Help us not to allow these last few years to rob us of the enjoyment that God wants us to have and never, ever be, feel guilty about having some happiness and never waiting on the next shoe to drop or, oh, i got to brace myself because if I'm going to get this high, that means I'm going to be this low. Oh, who, grief, who are you listening to? Let the Word of God inform your moment, even this moment. The Hebrew writer says, as a pastor, as a leader in the church, I'm to watch over your souls with joy. I'm going to be happy doing it, regardless. <laughs> you don't believe me? <laughs> Think about that. The Hebrew writer says, it very, to keep watch over your soul, he says, with joy. Yes, it is. I, I mean, with great joy. Do we do everything we can to love you and bring you along? See, this is not the first time ever in, in church history or any other thing over the last 2,000 years that the church has always wrestled with what is it going to take to bring people into, a, into an understanding. We have bodies of teaching, principles of Christian living that we taught. They usually taught them in the, frame, in the frame of questions and answers. Martin Luther did it. We have it all the way back at different times. That body of teaching is often called a catechism. We don't use that word. Uh, most evangelicals don't use that word, but it really it's the same thing, is that we have this. And so all of them were around two major questions. I'm all, we've seen it for hundreds and hundreds of years. That the question is, what is your only comfort in life and death? What is your only comfort in life and death? Well, uh, of course, that's putting our hearts toward God and knowing that the Holy Spirit is there. But the second question really was hinged very closely. In fact, a lot of the answers were very, you know, the first three out of a, like 140 answers, but the first three. But how many things are necessary for you, having now received this comfort, that you might live and die happily? Because if you don't live happy, you're not going to die happy. How many knows that we should live happy and the greatest gift we give to our family is that we died happy in Jesus. It's the greatest gift that you'll ever give is, is that merry moment. And so how to live and die, and they're all based around the fact that you, first and foremost, we must know the greatness and the depth. And, and when I say greatness, I'm talking about the, how far-reaching the misery of sin is. You can't fully appreciate Jesus until you know how dark the darkness is, until you understand that it is nothing to love or laugh at. It's nothing to embrace. That sin is what? It robs me of God's best in my life. It robs me and brings destruction on my life. And so I, I don't really fully know the depths. And if you've grown up in church or you come to Jesus as a child or as a teenager and something, sometimes we can get a little bit removed to know how how bad the dark is. It's, it's worse than you can ever, ever, ever imagine. And there's no sense enjoying it or no sense of going to it. No sense to dabbling in the darkness or anything to find out how good God is. Let us always be able to say that we, we have avoided and we despise the evil of what it is. Not those who are in the middle of it. Because sometimes if that's all you know, it's all you know. But you can't fall it. Until you understand. And so the second then, of course, is because we know the depth and depravity. It's called the depravity of sin. Uh, then secondly, we can know how, how wonderful it is to be redeemed from our sins and the redeemed by the Son of the living God. Redeemed by His prayer. Redeemed. And the third is, how do you spend the rest of your life being thankful and glorifying God for having been escaped? And so the, the very heart of happiness is, is understanding how wicked and evil is, how good the, the provision of redemption is, how good that God rescued our life, and how good it is that we can spend the rest of our life pursuing 
pursuing happiness, because he made it to, but pursuing it in the depths of our life that we might be able to glorify him and love him and give love to our family because we have went after him with our whole hearts. Pastor friend of mine is talking about a young man. He said to me, he said, I, he could see the exasperation. He said, I, an elderly couple spending, rather than their retirement years, spending 70s and 80s on a grandson whom fell in their lap, only hope, he had nothing else unless the state was going to have to take over with him. And he said, I got called in the house, and you can see he's sitting there 16 years of age, dressed, I mean, $150 ten, pair of tennis shoes on. And he's got his arms folded, and he's in defiance, and, and the grandparents are at a loss, done everything they can, in aging bodies and minds. And he said, now, he said, I'm trying to appeal to him, he said, son, do you understand that they didn't have to do this? And, and he interrupts him. He said, what do you think I ought to do? Spend the rest of my life saying thank you every day? He said, exactly. You are exactly to spend every day of your life for the rest of your life saying thank you. When's the last time you said thank you, Lord? When's the last time that you said, God, we ought to have a praise break right here and just say, bless you, Lord. I mean, we ought to have a moment and say, God is so good. I'm thankful. Pastor, don't, don't, don't get me started because if you give me, I may not. I, I'm just so grateful for his deliverance. Don't, don't stop, Pastor. You better keep going because if you give me a half a chance, I might have a praise outbreak and say, thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me and redeeming my life. Thank you, Lord. I would have been a waste and a mess. I tell you, time I was 20 years of age, I had three motorcycle wrecks and three car wrecks. And there is my, my baby sister, which is the baby of the sisters, four years older than me. She's out there. My dad said, come here, look at, look at her, look. And my sister's got anointing oil, and she's walking around my car, anointing my car. It's the only car I ever wrecked. I mean, didn't wreck. Only car I never done. I think I need to call her and have her come back again. No, we used to, we used, and my, my dad was kind of like, look at, look at her, We're like thinking it's strange. But, but uh, years later, we talked about the only car I never wrecked was the one she anointed. And all. <laughs> Why? Rescued. Snatched out. Snatched out of the fire. Hey, I, I, this is not in the note. I wasn't planning on doing it because you know what? Some of you need to understand your happiness is tied to how grateful you are and how thankful you are for what God has done in the moment that he's done in your life. And if you'll tie yourself to that, your life will absolutely. What do I mean? Well, the universal human experience is, just, you know, uh, you know, what must I know to live happily? The universal experience is absolutely inside of us. It's not sinful. It's not, a, it's not an evil impulse. It is, it's not to deny or resist. It's to go after God and to say, okay, Lord, all of my happiness really resides in the foundation of what you have made me, created me, and who you are. So that it is what? It's, it's not from God, but it's in God. What we want is God to let us live our own way, have it our own way. And God, would you do a little blessing over here and help me and get me through? No, no, no. God says, put yourself right in the center of who I am. And, 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 I, and there's a manual created for your life. And I know it from the very beginning. I, I was telling, telling some others, I, have you ever put a, together a playground set for your children? I got one recently for my grandkids. It come with a manual. Yeah. Inch thick in four languages. I mean to tell you what, I don't know. It looks really good. There's a little bag of stuff left over. But you know what? It looks wonderful. You know? It, it, how it's fit together. And we, the creator knows what will make you the happiest and will do if you give it to him. Basically, what, how do we live our life? We put ourselves in God. And I like the way one man said, we get the mercy and what? He gets all the glory. We get the happiness in him and he gets all the honor from us. And that really is absolutely the essence of it all. So to the extent we try to, to do it on our own way, or abandon the pursuit of our pleasure in Him, to that extent we will have the level of that, of, of that happiness. And so, as the, all of the, most all of them have a statement that says, the chief end of man then, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So they're right there in the heart of it all is joy and happiness and peace. That's why we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. Because there Jesus starts this message where He says, blessed. I like to be blessed, don't you? Oh, yeah. 
I, I tell you what I found out, that God wants to bless you so much to be a blessing. He does. But the old English word for blessed is happy. Happy. Uh, there, one of the magazines did a survey. What would, it, what would it take to make you happy? Why don't you ask that question to someone near you? What would it take to make you happy? This has been a great place to let people to have texted me, what would it take to make you happy? And throw it up on the screen right here in the middle of this. What would it take? Well, you know the answers. Here, friends, social life, job, being in love, recognition, success, sex, personal growth, good financial situation, having a house or apartment, being attractive, beautiful, the city, my religion, my recreation, my ex- being a parent, marriage, my partner, all of these things. What, what is the one thing that is in common all of them? All of them are externals. All of them are the circumstances around us. And the popular ideal is this, if I have everything around me, you know, in control and cooperating, like the man yesterday, I'm serious. I mean, in line, holla, no orange juice. You mean there's no, I'm not happy. There's no orange juice. I thought, brothers, that all it takes, little orange juice make you happy. I thought, this is a good time to preach this message. <laughs> Give one, one, but I didn't do it. I didn't, yeah. He goes, I can't believe a restaurant like this don't have any orange juice. I thought, really, brother? That is really going to ruin the universe and your life today. <laughs> you know? And, and it, what? Well, call it external. You know, most of it is along circumstances. It says it like this, when and then. When I get out of school, I'll be happy. Well, the graduates, that wasn't fair to you today because I know you are very happy. But when I get a job, I'll be happy. When I get married, I'll be happy. When I have kids, I'll be happy. When the kids leave home, then I'll be happy. Well, all those things, yeah. All of them on the outside. Well, a man gave us his entire journal. And you can pick up his journal every day. In fact, you ought to do it once a year. You ought to read the journal of a man who had everything. Everything. And you got to understand, you're reading it, and he's in a condition that he's, he's evaluating his life. And so when we're reading Ecclesiastes, we're reading things like this in chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, self, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found this too is meaningless. If you will save yourself a lot of time, if you'll go through Ecclesiastes and realize that he basically describes three dead ends. He says that the dead end is always in accumulating things. Things will never, ever create happiness. It only creates the capacity to want more. And so you understand, if you do not early on understand that you love people and use things, you will end up using people and loving things. If you do not get a grip on a materialistic society that we live in, you will find yourself on the wrong end of this. He also says experiencing pleasures. Thank God for experiencing pleasures. But it's not the end all. It is only a means of what his gift unto our life. And there's going to be pain and pleasure. And the lifetime pursuit of pain and pleasure. It's a lifetime. Avoiding pain, pursuing pleasure. Avoiding as much pain as possible. You're never going to avoid the pain of this world. There's going to be pain in this world. But that's always, there's pain in this world. But God is good and he's faithful and he'll be there with us in those moments. And so he says, achieving success I mean achieving success. Now that was one boy that got me as an, I mean as an eight-year-old uh, when the ball year ended and we won the little champ and they lined us up, Mike, and gave me my first trophy I, and I got all of them pats and all them out of boys and all that attention. I went, so this is what you get for these trophies. And so I pursued them. And I mean, man, I had a wall full of trophies by the time even graduating from high school and stuff. And I, I pursued my, I mean, yeah, you know, it was, it was, man, what you can gain from playing basketball, baseball, and football and stuff and getting that. And I, I, I want so much. I found out they gave you ribbons for track. And after the baseball game, I went to the county track meet. Now, I wasn't on the county team, but I talked to the coach into letting me participated in four events and went came home with three ribbons and I wasn't even on the track team uh, because why because they, uh, they gave you things and they brought you up and, they, and all of a sudden what happens is the more and the more and so when you're at type a like I am and you're pursuing put the carrot in front of me you know I'm a Pavlovian dog ring the bell and I'm going after it you know I mean just absolutely pursue pursue 
I remember taking, it took me a, a little while to get, I, I did a five years, it took me five years to get a three-year master's degree. I, did, I took the scenic route. And um, so I got through, and I, I come through on a Saturday afternoon, I remember, and there was a well-meaning gentleman, he loved me, but his first words, I mean, I'm walking with everybody, person, and, and my, my, my robe, he goes, when are you going to get your doctorate? I mean, give me a few minutes to drink the punch and eat the cookie. <laughs> it's never enough. It's never enough. And, and it, will, it won't be. And, and so here's Solomon saying to us, these are dead ends. You'll get down to the end of the cul-de-sac and have to turn around because happiness is not found on the end of that road. Howard Hughes and the famous... Wealth that he ever had, they asked him, how much does it take to make a man happy? He said, just a little bit more. Look how tragic he died and died. So happiness, Jesus says, is far more, it's the state of the heart. It's the heart condition, where your heart is. We're going to learn that the heart condition of these eight statements over these summer weeks and as we go in and out of guests and different ones, but where it's not so much what we have, it's not much who we are, it's what's in our heart. It's not the external that, yes, those things are gifts from God and they're, they're to be received. And uh, I, I often, Lord, thank you for this. Is there anyone that you want this to pass on to others? I, I've learned to live with a light hold on things because of the passing nature of them and give them and, and delight when God would say. But he starts out saying the whole happiness begins with being humble. Blessed are the poor, happy are those I, I, I didn't, I'm going to go through them later on, but not, I'm not going to take the time right in this moment. But there is a reality that happy are those, I've got that marked right here. Happy is what? Happy are the humble, they'll receive what God has promised. Happy are the humble, they will receive what God has promised. And so it starts with humility. Let's talk about real th three things real quick. Like, and I'm, I'm aware of the time here, but I, it's a long introduction to a, to a series. But he says this, Jesus says, if you will be, poor, and if you'll have the right estimation of yourself, if you'll humble yourself to heaven, to God himself, he'll do something. He's not talking about having low self-esteem. I have a contention that you can't humble yourself if you feel worthless. There's nothing to humble. You can't give yourself away if you don't fully love yourself and take care of yourself. There's nothing to give. So if you don't, are putting yourself down all the time, Jesus didn't die for the worthless, he died for people. He died for people that have value and significance and meaning. And, and listen to me, your life matters. It matters greatly to many of us. And though we are not celebrated on an everyday basis, we don't have to be because we know whom we are in God. We know in whom we are in Christ. And we accept the moment that we're in. And we say, oh, God, help me. I know that because of Jesus and because you have redeemed me, and, and, and I believe that for everyone in this room, may you be snatched out of the misery of sin, sin and misery. Don't ever take misery and sin away from one another because sin leads to misery, not happiness, misery. Misery, misery for you, and you don't sin in a vacuum. You don't sin in a vacuum. It'll affect other people too. I'm preaching better than some of you are amen, but don't you understand how this works? You, you amen, I go faster. Okay. Listen to me. Because of that moment when I say, okay, Lord, I'm not going to talk about lousy, evil, bad, nasty. I'm going to say, God, you're good. Change me. Redeem me. Reform me. I depend on you. I often really believe that the, the number one challenge of people praying is at this very point of humility and humble. That if, if you would just, I mean, every day take a moment to say, Father in heaven, holy is your name. Now I need to live your way. Give me the strength to live your way. Forgive anybody and everybody around me and forgive me and deliver me from the evil plan of the enemy on my life. Then you will begin a life that will give you greater happiness. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. What are they, what does happen? is it number one humility reduces and it brings a lot less stress with it isn't stress the, the thief of happiness it really is uh, there are moments when you just got to tell yourself I resign as the manager of the universe <laughs> can't control everyone can do when you realize that you don't, you can't solve all the problems I, I really bought into that early on 
People walk up, ask me a question. Uh, I must have, oh, I'm, I, I graduated from Bible college. I got to have an answer. And so, and, and now people ask me, you know, I, got, I, mean, I don't know. You don't know? No. We might try to figure it out together. But no, it's a great day when you don't have to be the answer person. In fact, he's, my son wanted to do, he said, I want to do a Q&A here in Sweden. I said, no, let's do a Q&R. He said, what do you mean? Question, and I'll respond, but I'm not sure it's an answer. <laughs> if you don't put me on the clock, I'll respond too long. Guy asked me the time, and I can tell him the history of the clock. <laughs> Y'all are too uptight for me today, you know that? What happened? We're living in the tension between the real and the ideal. And life falls somewhere in that line. Do you not have a standard of excellence and perfection? Yes, but not perfection. It can suck you in and think that perfection's possible. It's not possible. Why? Because we are there. And when, because we are there, we need to say, oh, God, help us. We're not always, there's that moments, it's not all, you're not going to find the ideal career. You're not going to have the ideal family, the ideal marriage, the ideal kids and all of those things. Listen, you got to give that up and live in the reality of the moment and the investment of what you put in the time and the things that comes from your life and say, oh, God, I humble myself. I depend on you. I need you. Re- help me, oh, God, because it will reduce the stress. Secondly, humility really improves relationships. It, I'm, I'm, I'm racing really quickly right now because I'm under the pressure of being perfect and letting you have not, not, I'm not a, if you don't know, I'm, I'm chilling like crazy. I'm having a good time. What humility does, listen, you know, who wants to be around proud, arrogant, egotistical, narcissist all the time? Who wants to? They suck the oxygen out of the room every time they walk in to cause a, you know, not happy. And, and you know, they're, they're the only one parts. And you know what? They, they are a pain in the blessed assurance. And that's pretty good. I need to write that in. They're self-centered people are never happy. And they suck everybody else down in the vortex of their gloom and doom. But to be around humble people... <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I had a couple of ladies in my church, believe it or not, came from different circumstances but found one another, served our church and me. They were, they were the janitors of our church, and both of them were named Jerry. Jerry and Jerry, G-E-R-R-Y and G-E-R-R-Y. We love them. Our family love them like crazy. I mean, they come every Tuesday to clean the church, and they started in my office, and they, they, they come in to lay hands on me every Tuesday. Pastor, that's a really good message. Now, you need to be a little longer on that altar call. And, they, and they, they trained me and taught me and stuff, loved me like crazy, was with me through all of those early years when 80 people turned into 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, all those years. And they, you know, and they, and, and really, Jerry, one of the little Jerry's grew up on the streets of a city as a child, had no parenting had uh, abuse, and yet one of the most happiest, humble people I've ever met in my entire life. And she had a place in me. She mothered me and had a hold and, and stuff. And, 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 and she would come in and, and say, uh, you know, want to talk to me and make sure that something I said just I might have had a little touch of arrogance on it. And she was there going to help me keep humble for the Lord. Now, you remember, do you remember when we didn't have very many people, Pastor? Do you remember when we were praying for the bills to be paid this week, Pastor? I mean, she'd remind me all, and, and I, Jerry, I do, honey, I do. When we got ready to go to the new church, and, and uh, we built about 100 acres, relocated, big old church and everything, uh, they came to me and they said, now, you know, you're going to have to have additional staff. It's, it's going to take about four people to run this place. You're going to have a night watchman. You're going to need professional genital care, and uh, you'll need to go ahead and end your relation. I went, mm-mm. They said, well, you, know, you, you, you can't keep paying them. I said, who says I can't keep paying them? And I said, hey, listen, they were with me when nobody knew us or knew what we were doing. And built. I said, them two right there, I said, we, they're gonna, we're going to keep them. Well, what, what are you going to need them for? Clean my office. Both of them? I said, both of them. Keep them on the payroll. We're going to pay. And I paid them until they both passed all the way through. You know why? Because that humility I needed near me. I needed to be reminded. And they loved me and take near me. And I needed, they'd whisper in the ear and tell me who to, they'd say, I, I don't have a good sense, Pastor, good spirit of some people. Just, just, uh, just protect yourself. And things like that. You know who it was. You know, loved on us and raised us, David. 
a lot of who we are because of Jerry and Jerry. And that, what humility brought great strength. Listen to me, folks. You can improve your relationship with just a few words. First one is, I'm sorry. Why don't you practice that right now to somebody? Say, I, I, I'm sorry. I had a man say to me, uh, I've been married 27 years to this woman. She never one time said to me, I'm sorry. I said, are you kidding me? Ding, ding, ding. What? <laughs> Alarms going off and everything else. No, you got to learn. I'm sorry. I'll tell you another one. I was wrong. I mean, just, I mean, the best thing you can do on your job is fess up quickly. Fess up quickly. I, I, I was at Reinhard Bonnke's f- funeral, and I, man, you know, just, I'm, I'm, I'm one of my great heroes of, most of my heroes are in past literature, because they, most of them don't mess up. So, but, but Reinhard Bonnke, I'd been with him and traveled, and I watched him, and had a young man that we knew and had served him for 15 years. I got him ready for that interview, and Andrew got to be the main speaker, and he told this story about he was doing his travel for several years, and they ended up in another country, the wrong continent of where they were supposed to be. And he, when he realized that they're landing, and they're in another country, he goes, Pastor, he said, I'm, I'm really, really sorry, but I, I hate to tell you I'm dying, but it's not the fault of the office. It's nobody back there. It's not the travel. It's me. I gave him the wrong information. We're in the wrong country. And Reinhard Bonnke laughed at him and said, wonderful. We get a weekend off. Come on, son. Let's go eat. And he said, we ate a big old dinner. He said, what do you want? You choose. Get the biggest steak we can find. And loved him. And that said it a lot about Andrew for fessing up and saying I was wrong. And a whole lot about a man of great grace and great stature who probably never knew that anybody would ever hear about that. But he was able to deal with the not ideal. Third thing you need to learn how to say is I need help. Please learn how to say, I need help. Please humble yourself when life gets challenging and say, I need help. When it's not perfect, it'll help reduce the strengths. It'll, it'll improve relationship. And, and let me tell you what, there's something that happens. God may use other. Because the third thing that he really does, it releases God's pay, power in your life. It releases God's help. It releases God's grace on your life. When you humble yourself, something moves toward you. James 4 and 7 or 6 says, God gives strength to the humble, but he sets himself against the proud. God gives grace, he says, to the humble, and he resists the proud. God gives strength to the humble. And so we learn that when we humble ourselves, why? When we humble ourselves, the goodness of God comes to our life. See, I say, live right before God. Do the right thing. Forgive yourself and others. Release that and be able to say, oh, God, help me to be in poor spirit. Help me to keep myself that the kingdom might come your way. I always want my family, I'm going to start, with, especially with my grandbabies now, teach them what favor is. Favor is a great moment in your life. When God just does something for you, nobody can do for you. When God opens it, when you know that it's just somebody was there at the right place, right? God just turns some events or something and favor happened to you. It's my favorite. One of my favorite stories on favor is that reality of Phil Snyd was pastor in this little church in Western West Virginia. We were there in a transition moment for that church too and and uh, BC years before children and and so we had taken a position at another place and so you back then you moved your account there was no debit cards or nothing and so all the, you go to the bank get your money and stuff so I tried to cash a check and the bank wouldn't cash because I, I didn't have no accounts no more my accounts were already in the southern part of the state so I went over to see her and she worked for Tracy Weber who was the, one of the lawyers in town and so I'm telling her she said you get your check cash I said no We've done move that. We'll, we'll do something, but we've done move the accountants. And uh, he overhears me, and she comes back and says, hey, won't you go over one more time? And I, I didn't know. I thought, that's a long way to walk down two flights of steps and go across the street. And so I'm, I'm like trying to, you know, he's standing there, and the tension's in the air. And feel, look, and I looked at her, and she could look at me like, uh, by the way, darling, happy birthday today. It's your birthday today. And so... I leave so early on Sunday morning, she didn't hear me say that, but I looked at her and she gave me that look like only men, you know, men knows what that look means. When a wife can look at you like, you idiot, do what I've just said while I'm being nice about it. You know, when God can't move you, but your wife can move you, you know, and, and I thought, well, okay, I guess it won't hurt to go do this again. And I, you know, and I didn't want to go down the bar, you know. So I oh, went yeah, down the steps, went across the road. And as I got across the road, there's a man in a suit, opens the door, says, Pastor Crumb. I went, 
Yeah. He said, come with me. We walk in there, and he comes up to a teller with a woman, and he says, uh, he takes my check, and he said, this is Pastor Crumb's check. Anything he needs while he's still in town, make sure, I thought, bless, God's about time people find out who I am. That's right. Don't you forgive it either, you know. So I strutted right back up there, and she smiled and said, did you get your check? I said, yeah. Said he, a man down there recognized me, called me Pastor Crumb, told a woman who I was, cash my, I cash anything I want. And she just smiles and she said, Yep, probably doesn't hurt that my boss is the chairman of the board of the bank and he made a phone call before you got there. To me, that's what favor is. God overrules the no and says yes, God overrules the block and says through. God overrules the wall and says, come down. God overrules the report and says, I have it another way. God overrules the opinion and says this. God overrules the negative word said, I got something else. God, oh, that's what favor. That's what we'll do. We'll humble yourself. God will put favor on your life. Let's pray.